Okay. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this SLC webinar on state strategies for shaping effective teacher preparation programs. My name is Miko Lindeberg and I am the Education Policy Analyst with the Southern Legislative Conference, the Southern Office of the Council of State Governments. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Before we begin, let me mention that our audience is in listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question, please type it in the question box on the GoToWebinar toolbar. You may do so at any time during the webinar. We will try to get as many of your questions as possible before the end of our program. Please also note that we will be recording this event and it will be available online at the CSG Knowledge Center at www.knowledgecenter.csg.org and on the SLC website at www.slcatlanta.org. The importance of ensuring effective teacher preparation programs, or TPPs, continues to be an issue of significant interest to state policymakers. As the focus of teacher prep education shifts more and more from training to preparing, several states are undertaking new approaches to identifying and promoting successful TPPs. Some strategies adopted in the SLC member states toward this end include raising program admission standards, requiring shadowing of highly effective teacher mentors, performance-based funding, and monitoring of program outcomes. As an example, Louisiana and Tennessee have developed statewide systems that track the academic growth of a K-12 teacher students back to the preparation program from which that teacher graduated. This webinar will focus on these and additional tactics of southern states to ensure well-prepared teachers. Our first speaker today is Sandy Jacobs, Vice President and Managing Director of State and District Policy at the National Council on Teacher Quality, or NCTQ. Before NCTQ, Ms. Jacobs worked at the U.S. Department of Education as a Senior Education Program Specialist for the Reading First and Comprehensive School Reform Demonstration Programs. Prior to that, she taught fourth and fifth grade for nearly a decade at Public School 9 in Brooklyn, New York. Ms. Jacobs was a Presidential Management Intern and a Charter Corps member of Teach for America. She holds a Master's Degree in Sociology of Education from Columbia University's Teachers College and a bachelor's degree in history from Columbia College. Our second speaker is Elizabeth Vilke, Senior Director of State and Member Relations at the Council for Accreditation of Educator Preparation, or CAPE. Prior to joining CAPE, Ms. Vilke worked as a teacher, vice principal, and acting principal for a total of nine years. Looking to have a broader impact in education, she earned a master's degree in administration and policy from the Catholic University of America in 2009 concentrating on teacher, teacher preparation and teacher retention rates. Ms. Vilke previously was Senior Director of Program Review at CAPE. In her current role, she acts as the liaison between states and her organization. Our final two speakers, representing the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, or AACTE, we have Dr. Jane Bray, Chair-Elect of the AACTE Board of Directors and Dean of Darden College of Education at Old Dominion University. Also from AACTE, we have Dr. Ann Larson, Chair of the Advisory Council of State Representatives of AACTE, and also Dean and Professor in the Department of Middle and Secondary Education, College of Education and Human Development at University of Louisville. Dr. Bray has been focus focusing on preparing teachers since 1992. Previous to Old Dominion, she was the Dean for the School of Education at Millersville University of Pennsylvania for 10 years, and then was appointed the Dean and Associate Provost at Millersville University for three years. In 2008, Dr. Bray was named Teacher Educator of the Year by Pennsylvania. She has been appointed by the Governor of Pennsylvania two times to serve as a Commissioner on the Commonwealth's Professional Standards and Practices Commission. Dr. Larson's research areas are professional development and schools, teacher education, teacher development, and English education. She currently serves on the Department of Teaching and Learning's Middle and Secondary Program Committee, co-coordinates the college's CAPE accreditation, and co-leads faculty facilitators of the college-wide self-study and educator preparation committee work. And so, with those introductions, I'll now turn it over to Director Jacobs from NCTQ. Thank you, Miko. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sandy Jacobs, and I'm with the National Council on Teacher Quality. Uh, pleasure to have an opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. I'm going to uh, apologize in advance. I have a bit of a cold, and I'm going to try my best not to cough at you for the next 10 minutes. Um, but if I do, please forgive me. 
Um, if, yeah, could go to the next slide, please. Uh, just to start by telling you uh, a bit about the National Council on Teacher Quality, if you're not familiar with NCTQ, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit research and policy group. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C., and we focus entirely on issues uh, that impact the teaching profession, focusing especially on uh, state teacher preparation programs, teachers unions, and, and school districts. Uh, next slide. I always like to start with a visual to remind us all why we're having this conversation, um, especially as we kick off a, a conversation like this where you're going to hear from a variety of, of people. Um, what we know uh, clearly from research is that teachers matter a lot and um, you know, that, that great teachers accomplish great things for kids and weak teachers unfortunately don't. And uh, the conversation here is not, you know, what do we do about weak teachers? The conversation here is how do we make sure that we are uh, starting out our new teachers on a path to success? How do we make sure they have the, pre the training that provides uh, the knowledge and skill set that they need when they enter the classroom to be on track, to be a high performer, and, and to make sure that they're really setting up kids for success? There's been a lot of uh, attention over the last few years. A lot of the policy conversation around teachers over the last five years or so has focused a lot on teacher effectiveness, uh, and in particular, teacher evaluation and the issues related to that, that that really talk about what's going on with the teachers who are in the classroom. And that's important, um, but we're really pleased to see the conversation now shifting to the pipeline. And, how do we make sure that the preparation that we're giving teachers is, uh, is what they need to, so that they will be effective teachers once they get into the classroom? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, NCTQ has two big areas of work um, that, that support uh, the information I'm going to share with you this afternoon. Our 2015 edition will be out in about two weeks, in, in early December, and um, there's a, we, we produce a volume for each state. Uh, this year's edition is our comprehensive edition, so we'll be looking at every aspect of state's teacher policies, um, with teacher preparation being a very, very big part of that. Um, if you are not familiar, if you haven't seen our yearbook before, we'd be very happy to get you a copy. If anybody wants to uh, shoot me an email, you'll see my contact. Uh, information at the end of this um, at the end of this presentation, we um, have not just um, the status of of each state's policy, but also specific recommendations as as well as lots of na national context. So you can see what other states are doing as well. And then we also conduct our teacher prep review, where we take a close look at what is going on uh, in individual teacher prep programs uh, across the country. And uh, on our website, you can find lots of information about individual teacher preparation programs. Uh, next slide. So uh, what I wanted to do this afternoon was focus in on just to give you the policy landscape. I know this is very limited time, so can't really dive into the uh, too far into the weeds of each of these topics, but just wanted to give you uh, an overview of what we see as the real, um, the four policy levers where states are already have policy impacting uh, teacher preparation programs. So in most cases, it's not about needing to add lots of new policies and new requirements as much as making sure that the policy that's there is really supporting and shaping uh, a quality teacher preparation for our, our prospective teachers. Uh, some of these Miko already alluded to, uh, the first being the admission standards for, for who goes into a teacher preparation program in the first place. Uh, the second being how we make sure that our teacher candidates have the subject matter knowledge that we uh, need them to take into the classroom. Um, the third is uh, the, the pedagogy and the teaching skills that, um, that teachers need, and in particular, with so much focus on uh, college and career readiness standards, with so many states having changed their standards for students over the last few years, um, are the requirements for new teachers uh, changing in ways that match up with those new, uh, new requirements for students, or do we in some states have uh, some, some real misalignment there? 
And then finally, how teacher prep program, uh, how states rather, hold uh, individual institutions and teacher prep programs accountable uh, for the quality of their graduates. And I just want to underscore, repeat what I just said, that all of these are areas where virtually every state already has policy. So not asking um, you know, to, to undertake uh, big new sets of, of legislation or, or rules and regulation, but, but making sure that those policies are as strong as they can be. So on the next slide, uh, we'll look a little bit at admissions. And um, this is an area where we see uh, a lot of uh, progress over the last couple of years. States are beginning to raise the bar for admission to teacher preparation programs. Um, but still, this is an area where uh, most states still set quite a low bar for entrance. Uh, and this is in terms of the academic background of our prospective teachers. Uh, 16 states now require a, a, a minimum of a 3.0 GPA. And uh, an additional three states require a, a, a test, a test of academic proficiency such as the SAT, ACT, or GRE uh, that is specifically normed to the college-bound population. What we see that a lot of states do is they uh, require prospective teachers to take a basic skills test that is normed towards um, teacher candidates only, so it doesn't tell us how that population compares to uh, everybody going to college uh, overall to make sure that we are, are getting applicants with that strong academic background. Um, I will say that a lot of the progress that we see here on states uh, raising the bar for admission has to do uh, with CAPE accreditation standards, which I know you're going to hear about uh, from uh, the next presenter, so I'm not going to uh, to go into a lot of detail about that. Um, but even where states have adopted CAPE standards, we encourage them to make sure that their own policy very clearly outlines uh, what, the, what is expected for the academic background of, of students. Uh, I know there are states and um, policymakers who have expressed concern that if they um, raise the admission standards, they might impact the diversity of who uh, of their um, prospective teachers, um, or that they're you know by drawing a line in the sand keeps people uh, who are very talented potentially out because they just you know maybe they just missed the cutoff. Um, one thing that we've encouraged states to think about is using GPA and a test score in tandem uh, to use a sliding scale so that uh, one could compensate for the other. Um, that gives flexibility in, in admissions requirements. That's what the NCAA, NCAA does for ac academic eligibility. So that could be one way to bring some additional flexibility here. Um, another thing that we've seen states do is, is raise the bar. Um, say, you know, require a 3.0 GPA or, or a test score in the top 50th percentile, but also allow programs uh, a certain, you know, small uh, um, set aside that, that is exempt from that requirement. So, so you could admit 10% of your candidates that don't meet that requirement. That, that leaves programs some, some flexibility uh, to take in, you know, sometimes you just have that, that great feeling about somebody. Um, another thing that we've seen states doing, and this is something that the CAPE standards uh, support as well, is not making these standards so much about individuals as about cohort. So that a program has to take in a cohort that meets this high bar, um, that leaves the program flexibility to balance uh, among the individuals who make up that cohort. Uh, so next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, taking a look at content knowledge, um, we're focusing here on elementary teachers because this is an area that traditionally states have set a very low bar um, for expecting elementary teachers to know the elementary, uh, the elementary content that they're going to teach, uh, particularly with uh, the shift to college and career readiness standards with so much focus on informational text and building content knowledge and uh, vocabulary through informational text, it's more important than ever that elementary teachers really deeply know the subject matter um, that they're going to teach. Uh, five years ago when we tracked this, pretty much every state had, um, a, if they required a test, it was a test uh, in most cases that had a composite score. So all you needed was an overall passing score, which would allow you to be very weak 
in a single uh, subject area, maybe even in multiple subject areas, if you could balance it out in strength, with strengths in other areas. Um, you know, thinking about, um, uh, about math and science, uh, we really need to make sure that our elementary teachers know all the subject matter that they're teaching. And so this is an area where we've seen a really big shift in the last few years. 22 states now require uh, elementary teachers to, to pass a, a content test that requires uh, a separate passing score for each subject. Um, I didn't put slides in to show you um, middle school and, and secondary. At the secondary level, most states do require um, a content test for, for most teachers. Um, middle school, however, is an area where um, some states only require middle school teachers to, require, to pass an elementary level uh, content test. Uh, that seems, you know, pr pretty problematic on its face in, in making sure uh, that our teachers are ready to, to teach more advanced content. And I also wanted to add a note here about special education. Most states, uh, the overwhelming majority of states, don't require any content testing at all uh, for special education teachers. It is a very small number of states that require that. Um, so we are setting a very low bar for special education uh, teachers when, in fact, we're expecting our special education students to meet the same bar as, as typical students. Uh, next slide. So um, I mentioned at, uh, in my introduction um, that with so many states having changed their K-12 uh, student standards in the last few years, we were very interested to see whether uh, states were changing their teacher standards, their requirements for what new teachers should know and be able to do to reflect uh, the changes that we see on the uh, student side. And we've actually found a very, very small number of states that have really engaged in, in this work. Uh, you can see from the slide that Arkansas is a real leader here. Um, Arkansas has very thoroughly uh, developed uh, you know, uh, new teacher standards that are aligned with college and career readiness standards. Uh, they didn't just add in a few key words to the standards they already had. Um, they, they have a level of alignment now between their teacher standards and their um, student standards that we don't find in many other places. Um, Illinois uh, developed a new middle school license recently, and the middle school standards uh, look very strong because they were uh, developed from, from scratch. Unfortunately, the state didn't, didn't revise any of its other standards at, at the same time. Um, most other states' teacher standards are either unchanged uh, from, from the time, you know, since before they adopted new K-12 standards, uh, or reflect very, very superficial uh, cursory changes. So, so this is something where um, I think we are really concerned that we are um, the, the standards that states are giving teacher prep programs to work with uh, are really out of date for what they're going to find in the current classroom. So, so this is a real uh, uh, area uh, in need of attention. Um, some of the other pedagogical areas that states control at the policy level that I didn't put in, um, in slides. Uh, one is student teaching. Nearly all states um, uh, mandate at the, uh, at the state level some basic requirements around field experience. I'm sure you're going to hear um, from the other panelists how much the field is embracing uh, field experiences and making sure that our prospective teachers have a lot of uh, experience in the classroom before they actually become the teacher of record. Um, most states uh, do require uh, a student teaching experience and do require it to be a full-time, you know, full semester experience. Where we find states being less careful is about the selection of uh, what classroom a, a student teacher can go in and making sure that we're only uh, pairing uh, student teachers with, with very strong mentor teachers, uh, both very strong in terms of their own teaching, but also their ability uh, to work with, with prospective teachers. And next slide, please. <coughs> and finally, um, all states are required uh, under federal law, under the federal HEA requirements, to have an accountability system um, that, 
that uh, monitors uh, teacher preparation programs in the state. Um, only 17 states require any evidence of student achievement to be part of that accountability system. In other words, uh, do graduates of teacher preparation programs go on to become effective teachers? That's not to say that that should be the only measure. It absolutely shouldn't be the only measure, but it seems an important uh, part of the equation. Uh, we also see that most states work have an accountability system. They haven't set clear standards for performance, so uh, they may lay out to programs, these are the standards you're supposed to meet, and they may even have some objective data that they collect and report as part of that system. Um, but if you haven't set standards for performance, what are the minimum expectations that a program needs to meet? Well, then you haven't really established an accountability system. Um, bringing transparency and, and sharing that data with the public is, is a great step forward and very important, but you don't really have an accountability system uh, without those standards of performance. Uh, so I don't want to go over my uh, share of the time, so uh, I'm going to stop here. Just on the next slide, uh, you can see my contact information uh, where you can get um, uh, our website where you can see uh, all the information we have available. As I say, if you are interested in seeing our uh, upcoming uh, yearbook report with a specific edition for your state, please uh, email me and we will be sure that gets to you. Uh, I know we're going to take questions at, at the end of uh, the session, and I'd be very happy uh, to answer any questions anyone has at that time. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, uh, Ms. Jacobs, for that uh, interesting presentation. Uh, we'll now turn it over to our next presenter, uh, Director Vilke at the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation. Great. Thank you, Miko. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, so thank you for the invitation. Um, as Miko said, I'm Elizabeth Vilke. I'm the Senior Director of State Member Relations with CAPE. Um, we are the Council of the, for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation. CAPE accredits what we call educator preparation providers, so we refer to them as EPPs. Um, because we're in education, so we need a couple more acronyms. Um, so you might refer, hear me during this presentation refer to EPPs that CAPE accredits. Next slide. CAPE is a relatively new organization. CAPE was founded in 2013 and really was the result of a merger between NCATE, which was the National Council for the Accreditation of Teacher Preparation, and TIAC, um, the Teacher Education Accreditation Council. And so the merger um, left CAPE as the sole accreditor for educator preparation in the United States. Next slide, please. CAPE's mission is to advance excellent educator preparation through evidence-based accreditation that assures quality and supports continuous improvement to strengthen P12 student learning. And then through our vision um, to increase the value of accreditation to be an attribute demanded by the public while expanding its fruit footprint by bringing more providers into the accreditation fold. Um, one question that I'm often asked when I go out and do presentations about CAPE um, really is what is the purpose of accreditation? And so the purpose of accreditation is to assure teacher candidates, parents, employers, policymakers and the public that a CAPE accredited provider has been rigorously evaluated and has met or exceeded high standards of quality. And we'll talk a little bit more about those standards in just a moment. Next slide, please. I first wanted to talk through just the process of CAPE accreditation. The CAPE accreditation process has several steps. CAPE accreditation takes place on a seven-year cycle, and EPP should be collecting and analyzing their data throughout the seven years, not just when it comes time to do their site visit, for the purpose of continuous improvement. And you'll hear me over the course of this presentation talk a lot about continuous improvement, which really is the focus of what CAPE is trying to work with EPPs on. 
Um, three years prior to the on-site visit, providers pursuing CAPE accreditation can submit assessments. Um, and these assessments could be drawn from clinical observation instruments, dispositional assessments, employer surveys, exit surveys, and other sources that providers plan to use in making their case that the programs meet the CAPE standards. This is a service CAPE offers to help providers and the field improve the quality of assessments to ensure there is valid evidence and to help increase the likelihood of producing quality evidence. And this is one aspect of CAPE accreditation that did not exist um, in either of our predecessor organizations. About eight months prior to the on-site visit, the EPP submits a self-study. During a multi-year self-study process, providers gather and present data and other evidence relevant to the CAPE standards and components. Reflecting on their current functioning, effectiveness, and continuous improvement, they submit an electronic report that is reviewed by a site visitor team. After providers submit their self-study report, a formative review occurs. CAPE assigns a visitor team of trained peer reviewers to conduct a formative off-site review in which they explore the quality and depth of evidence that providers use to make their case for meeting the standards and to determine the focus of the site visit. After the formative review, the team conducts a two to three day site visit to review evidence, verify data, and examine pedagogical artifacts, which could be things like lesson plans, student work samples, videos, um, or any other evidence that the provider is using to um, meet the CAPE standards. During the visit, the team also interviews provider leaders, faculty, mentor teachers, students, K-12 administrators, and others. At the conclusion of the site visit, the visitor team will give a preliminary report to the provider that sum summarizes its analysis about the accuracy and quality of the evidence, what was verified and not verified, and strengths and deficiencies. The site visitor team identifies the extent to which evidence supports each standard, including any particular strengths or deficiencies. The visitor team, however, does not conclude whether the standard is met. It provides a written report that includes a summary to what we call the Accreditation Council. It is up to the Accreditation Council, then, to make the decisions on whether or not standards are met or not met, and then also determines the overall accreditation decision. Um, running parallel to all of this work is annual reporting. Each year during the seven-year cycle, providers also submit annual reports that gather data on eight annual measures. Next slide, please. These measures demonstrate impact around student learning, teacher effectiveness, employer and completer satisfaction, and specific outcomes in consumer information such as graduation, licensure, employment, and student loan default rates. This data informs CAPE about the degree which providers continue to meet CAPE standards between accreditation visits and provides important information for the benefit of consumers that providers can use in their self-study to analyze trends and demonstrate their use in their continuous improvement efforts. Next slide, please. And so all of this brings us to the standards and what the providers are actually showing evidence for. Um, the CAPE standards really could be used as levers for improving educator quality. The CAPE standards are based on the following levers, to build partnerships and strong clinical experiences, which Sandy was just referring to. Um, build partnerships and strong clinical experiences, excuse me, raise and assure candidate quality, data-driven continuous improvement, um, that these standards are for all providers, not just um, those contained in IHEs or institutions of higher education. Um, the insistence that preparation be judged by outcomes and impact on P12 student learning and development 
And outcomes matter. And then more importantly, data about those outcomes matter. Effort is not enough, but the result of that effort is what we're looking for. The five CAPE standards flow from these principles, and the standards of evidence that define them are the backbone of the accreditation process. They define quality in terms of organizational performance and serve as the basis for the accreditation reviews and judgments. Next slide, please. So this brings us to standard one. And the focus of standard one really is the content and pedagogical knowledge of the candidates and the programs within the provider. Standard one states, the provider ensures that candidates develop a deep understanding of the critical concepts and principles of their discipline and by completion are able to use discipline-specific practices flexibly to advance the learning of all students toward attainment of college and career-ready standards. The standard asserts the importance of a strong content background and foundation of pedagogical knowledge for all candidates. Teaching is complex, and preparation must provide opportunities for candidates to acquire knowledge and skills that can move all P12 students forward in their academic achievements. Such a background includes experiences that develop deep understanding of major concepts and principles within the candidate's field, including college and career ready expectations. There are five standards, excuse me, five components under standard one. I would encourage you um, to go to our website and look through the standards and the components. Um, we really don't have enough time on this webinar to go through each component. Um, but should you have any questions about the components, please feel free to um, let me know. My contact information will be at the end of this presentation. Standard two deals with clinical partnerships and practice and states the provider ensures that effective partnerships and high quality clinical practice are central to preparation so that candidates develop the knowledge, skills, and professional dispositions necessary to demonstrate positive impact on all P12 students' learning and development. There are three components under Standard 2 that focus on clinical partnerships, clinical educators, and clinical experiences. And when you read through the components, um, the order of those components is very intentional because you need strong clinical partnerships and strong clinical educators in order to have meaningful clinical experiences. Education as a practice profession and preparation for careers in education must create nurturing opportunities for aspiring candidates to develop, practice, and demonstrate the content and pedagogical knowledge and skills that promote learning for all students. Standard three deals with the candidate quality recruitment and selectivity and states the provider demonstrates that the quality of candidates is a continuing and purposeful part of its responsibility from recruitment and admission through the progression of courses and clinical experiences and to decisions that completers are prepared to teach effectively and are recommended for certification. The provider demonstrates the development of candidate quality is the goal of educator preparation in all phases of the program. And so the components under standard three, uh, next one is standard four, which deals with the program impact. This standard is very different than standards one through three because it deals with data from the teachers once they've completed a program and they're now in the field. So standard four says the provider demonstrates the impact of its completers on P12 student learning and development, classroom instruction and schools, and the satisfaction of its completers with relevance and effectiveness in their program. The four components under standard four ask EPPs to collect data on their completers in the field where the preparation matters most. The data collected includes data on the impact of P12 student learning and development, indicators of teaching effectiveness, satisfaction of employers, and satisfaction of completers. Standard five 
um, is where all of um, the data that's been collected for standards one through four come together. Standard four says the provider maintains a quality assurance system comprised of valid data from multiple measures, including evidence of candidates and completers' positive impact on P12 student learning and development. The provider supports continuous improvement that is sustained and evidence-based and that evaluates the effectiveness of its completers. The provider uses the results of inquiry and data collection to establish priorities, enhance program elements and capacity, and test innovations to improve completers' impact on P12 learning and development. Next slide, please. And so one of the biggest challenges we face is to create a culture that has surrounded the new CAPE standards to make them meaningful and actionable. So this, this culture of evidence that we're trying to build. Evidence is central to CAPE's mission, and it's a capacity building agenda with a number of parts. We need stronger data and data systems. This means better assessments. It means better state and national data systems. As these grow, they can help EPPs by reducing reporting burdens and strengthening continuous improvement. As we create better data, the data also must be used effectively by EPPs. CAPE accreditation will ask EPPs to evaluate the quality of the evidence they present regarding standards in their self-study. CAPE is also focused on building better evidence through research itself. We have a number of initiatives intended to build evidence that can inform programs. CAPE's research committee will be setting a research agenda to promote strategic research on educator preparation. It will also study the impact and effectiveness of CAPE standards. Next slide, please. CAPE wants to move the field from anecdotes. We often hear those anecdotes from principals that say, well, I hire teachers from University of X because I know they're good teachers. Or we hear faculty say, I know they'll be a good teacher. I can, I can feel it. So we want to move from anecdotes, next slide, please, to using evidence to make decisions. So I know we are preparing good teachers because there is evidence that they have an impact on student learning. Next slide, please. And next slide. We can skip this one. CAPE also wants to continue to foster the culture of evidence so EPPs move from collecting data and evidence, next slide, to actually using that information. Next slide. Oh, I think, I'm sorry, you might have to hit it again. There you go. Um, to actually using that information to move from a compliance model to continuous improvement. Next slide. So that outcomes become the goal. Next slide. Um, and so CAPE is working to establish partnership agreements with states. The agreements aid in promoting excellence in educator preparation by coordinating state program approval along with national accreditation processes. Um, the agreement describes the partnership and delineates the processes and policies um, in that partnership agreement. Um, I provided this map just for your FYI. We currently have about 18 partnership agreements with states. Um, if you have a question about where your state falls, please just let me know and we can talk through that. Another handful are expected by the end of the, um, by the, end of the year. Um, next slide, please. Um, these are just some policy impl implications of CAPE's work. Um, although this isn't just CAPE's work, it's state work, it's association's work. And I think, as Sandy said earlier, this is such an important conversation to be having at this point in time. Um, next slide. I know that I've gone slowly over my time because of the sound issue, but I wanted to um, leave you with this quote. This is from CAPE Board of Directors Mary Brabeck during her testimony during a Senate Help Committee briefing. 
Um, it says, we now have a historic opportunity to do what the Flexner Report did for medical education in, in 1910. That report called in American medical schools to enact higher admission and graduation standards and to adhere strictly to robust scientific knowledge in teaching and research. Flexner transformed medical education, making it the clinical model it is today, and spurred the transformation of North American medicine into a profession. And so we have now this unique opportunity to do the same in teacher preparation, ultimately improving the outcomes for our nation's students. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Wilkie, for that uh, informative presentation also. Um, we'll now turn it over to our two final presenters from the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, uh, Chair-elect Bray and Chairwoman Larson. Thank you. If you could move to the next slide. Thank you, um, uh, Miko, for including AACTE in this webinar and giving us the privilege to speak to you. Uh, Anne and I are both very involved in the southern states and our state perspectives. And so we'd like to do three things today uh, as quickly as we possibly can. We'd like to bring in a little bit first of the state perspectives from what we call our state chapter organizations, which represent all of our teacher preparation or educator preparation programs. We'd like to then give you some very specific examples of state initiatives that are occurring right now or have occurred very recently. And then finally, we'd like to end up with a little bit of um, areas that we consider as very much of a significant focus or items or of interest for us in our teacher preparation programs and certainly a great focus for us as we are moving forward. And if you move to the next slide, please, I'll begin. So you're going to hear a little bit of overlap with our presentation as well as with Kate. AACTE is a strong supporter of CAPE as our accrediting body for teacher preparation or educator preparation programs. So you'll hear a little bit of the, of the same in, inferences as well as certainly the same measures that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to begin by just talking about utilizing multiple measures for accountability. And I think you've actually heard that several times today. Teaching is such a complex process as well as school systems themselves in communities and different types of communi communities are so complicated that no one indicator alone would be able to measure or evaluate teacher preparation programs or program quality for that matter. So we're asking that, that all of what we do would be based on multiple measures. And that would include things like the job placement, certainly retention of our teachers in the field, teacher performance, uh, graduate satisf satisfaction from our programs, employer satisfaction, and certainly impact on student learning. And we do, we're doing those things in terms of valid and reliable research. The research base for us is an important piece as we are going about evaluating and assessing the quality of our programs. We also are very concerned about providing support and growth for opportunities in our programs. If a program is identified as lacking in an area, it's particularly important for us that we provide the support as well as the information that that program needs to improve. I'll touch a little bit later on the short teacher shortages that we have in, in the southern states as well as around the rest of the country. And certainly the, the opportunities for us to provide support as we are assessing programs is, an, is a critical piece for us in light of the teacher shortages and how we can move to best um, overcome some of those particular challenges. We also want um, to talk about evaluating all teacher preparation programs equally. And I know that that was a piece in the CAPE presentation. And, and what we're talking about right now is that there are multiple programs and multiple models for preparing teachers. It's important for us, if we are going to identify standards for teacher preparation programs, 
that those standards be applied to all programs, regardless of whether it's coming out of an institution or another type of preparation. And simultaneously, we're asking that those accountability measures be reviewed um, by all of those programs. It shouldn't just be then teacher preparation programs deciding what those measure, measures should be. We are asking that and, and encouraging that all programs be at the table to be talking about what it is we want, how we need to evaluate teacher preparation programs, and certainly focus on accountability that would apply to all preparation programs. I'm going to move over to Ann now. If you go to the next slide, Ann's going to pro provide us with some specific examples. Thank you, Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ann Larson of the University of Louisville College of Education and Human Development. I'm pleased, as uh, Jane said, to share uh, some of our work through AACTE and the state chapters with you this afternoon. This slide focuses on background information, some contextual examples of relevant state policy and action. Through AACTE, <clears throat> we share policy and research-based practices regarding teacher education and educator preparation. We do this at national meetings, at summer institutes, at, um, through our state chapters, through webinars, interactive internet network improvement communities, our profession, as uh, was referenced in the Kate presentation um, around the Flexner report and those uh, reforms, is about the common good at present. So we do share with each other, <clears throat> and AACT is very instrumental in that. Uh, recent state chapter activity, one example Jane and I wanted to share with you is an initiative in Georgia called Project SWIM. SWIM is an acronym for Statewide Induction Model, um, and the standards and assessments currently used in Georgia, including EdTPA for pre-service teachers, Canada Assessment Performance Standards for pre-service teachers, and teacher assessment performance standards for in-service teachers were reviewed in Georgia to identify specific learning outcomes. A SWIM matrix was created and consists of six areas. Number one, resilience. Number two, learning. Number three, instructional delivery. Number four, assessment of and for learning. Number five, learning environment and number six, professionalism and communication. Um, AACTE's Ed Prep Matters and the GACTE chapter have uh, this information on their website. And adopted or proposed regulations related to teacher licensure in three states, including Arkansas, Mississippi, and Tennessee, include the following. In Mississippi and Tennessee, general modifications to licensure requirements including specifying types of licenses and standards for licensure were enacted. In Arkansas, <clears throat> they've implemented new pre-service assessments for licensure. Um, they do not yet specify which assessments, but we uh, anticipate uh, monitoring that state's progress. Adopted or proposed regulations related to educator preparation program approval in four states um, included Arkansas, Florida, South Carolina, and West Virginia. They've increased admission requirements to educator preparation programs. They've included metrics that focus on placement rate, retention rate, student learning growth, teacher evaluation scores. Such are examples of program approval requirements in Florida. And of course, um, all of these states, and including others, are aligning with the CAPE standards. Finally, um, as was mentioned earlier, a number of the states have CAPE state partnership agreements either approved and signed or in progress. The SLC, the Southern Legislative Conference states to date, include Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, South Carolina, and West Virginia. Um, we, we, again, are monitoring these. We know that many others are likely to follow, and we look forward to sharing with each other, again, these best practices. 
I'm going to now toss the baton back to Jane Bray. And if you can go to the next slide, please. So we're going to end by sharing a little bit of um, what we, we talk about at teacher preparation programs as we focus heavily on accountability and evaluating our programs so that we can prepare the best educators possible. And, and in defining educators as, as most of our institutions in the southern states as well as other states, we don't just prepare teachers, but counselors, we prepare principals, we prepare superintendents for in the, in the schools. And so the educator preparation program uh, that Elizabeth referred to is, is where that EPP comes from because we, we do focus on preparing lots of educators, not just teachers. But one item that we talk about quite a bit in our programs is about teacher shortages. And so while we are heavily focused on accountability, as well as uh, program evaluation and how are our candidates doing and what Im impact are they having. We would really like the southern states as well to talk about teacher shortages. That's a critical piece of this conversation so that we can all move forward. We also talk about the federal regulations. I, I think you're all in tune with the federal regulations and, and I would just say that it is uh, definitely an unfunded mandate for the states that really have very, very little time to prepare for what the mandates are requiring. The lack of pilot testing um, and the fact that it moves us into more of a test and punishment mentality in higher ed as it has been in the K through 12 systems is very problematic for us and we talk about that quite a bit. We'd also like to draw your attention to value-added models because that actually hasn't been a part of our conversation so far. And indeed, that's a huge part of what we talk about in accountability measures in our teacher preparation programs. Um, and I would refer to just recently AERA, which stands for the American Educational Research Association, issued a study and a statement on November 11th um, cautioning everyone about the value-added models and, and certainly um, acknowledge that value-added models are a good use for student learning, but real, they really question the transfer of that to program accountability and assessment. And then finally, um, an item that we talk about ad nauseum is, is collaboratively designed measures. I would encourage all of the southern states, as we're talking about program accountability, to not only have the programs at the table, but also have divisions or school districts at the table, their personnel, have teachers at the table. It's really important for those of us in higher education to make sure that whatever is occurring for us in terms of accountability and assessment and program quality be what's also needed in the field. And so collaboratively designed programs or measures for accountability are important pieces for us. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to turn it back over to Miko. OK, thank you, uh, Dr. Bray and Dr. Larson. Um, I'm not sure we've, we've had uh, questions come in, but uh, I, I, as everybody was kind of speaking, definitely hit some very interesting points um, and, a, and a, a series of strategies. And I'm wondering if, if, if you would consider, as a state policymaker, if, if you're thinking about maybe adopting, uh, you know, these effective educator preparation programs, teacher preparation programs. Do you see uh, one particular state policy or program component uh, that uh, that would be most critical for ensuring high-performing teachers, or is it really a, a kind of a, a series of parts that have to come together um, to work as a whole? Uh, I, I saw that uh, Ms. Vilke had definitely um, a focus on evidence, it seemed like, was a critical component. Um, maybe you could confirm or correct that. And I'd be curious to see if uh, any, any of our other presenters had a, had a take on that. Yeah, so that's certainly been a focus of the CAPE accreditation and that providers are making decisions about their programs based on evidence. So it's not just, well, we think this what makes a good program, but they actually have evidence, not only from their candidates that are currently in the programs, 
but from their completers once they get out into the field when their preparation actually matters. And so, you know, this is a heavy lift, lift for providers. Um, you know, they have not been asked to provide evidence in the same way that CAPE is asking for. Um, so there's definitely um, this move to building a culture of evidence um, so that the decision making within the program or the provider is based on that evidence. I would add to that. Um, we certainly do support what Elizabeth just shared about evidence and, and strongly support that, I might, I might emphasize. One of the things that, that I think was briefly mentioned but, but really deserves more is about clinical. Mm -hmm. And I believe, I believe the clinical piece is an enormously large indicator of program um, effectiveness as well as can serve for that program evaluation. And basically, if, if, if our candidates cannot perform in the field, um, that's very problematic. And the more we can get them out there and performing, I believe, and I believe teacher preparation programs as well as educator preparation programs would agree that clinical experiences are vital. However, we need to collect the evidence to, to share that. Uh, and I would like to add to that as well, <clears throat> um, and this is Ann Larson at University of Louisville. Uh, yesterday I was at a cooperative meeting with 13 superintendents in the uh, region surrounding Jefferson County, Louisville, Kentucky, and these superintendents were very interested in our CAPE standard around field and clinical experiences and candidate performance. And one of the things that I was very pleased to hear from them in their partnership with us in, in the EPP is, and, and nationally is, is the case as well, is they want to ensure that the highest quality teachers are mentoring and hosting our teacher candidates. And so the selectivity for that um, not just over the intercom, you know, who wants to take a student teacher, you know, we, we're in an era now, just as in medical education or other professional settings, where we want um, very high quality teachers to be working with us as partners in the preparation of teacher candidates for initial certification. Yeah, and Anne, you're absolutely right, and the only thing that I'll, I'll add to that is, not only identifying those high quality clinical educators or mentor teachers, but also ensuring that they have the training that's yeah. needed to, mm -hmm. to work with the residents or student teachers or whatever they're called in that specific program. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Okay. Well, uh, thank, thank you for the, those uh, responses. Um, I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Uh, if there are questions uh, any, any of attendees would like to follow up with, you can send them our way. Uh, we'll make sure we forward them to the appropriate presenter and follow up with the re response at a later time. Uh, thank you again to our presenters and experts here for their time and contributions. We'd also like to, like to thank our colleagues over at CSG for your assistance with the technical aspects of this webinar. If there's anything more that the SLC can do to assist you in your work, please don't hesitate to contact us. And we hope you have an enjoyable rest of your afternoon.